Hey gentlemen, today we're talking about post-finasteride syndrome. Uh, it's a syndrome that affects a very small amount of people who use finasteride, so I don't want to fear monger, but I also want to recognize that it is a possibility for people who use finasteride. It is a legitimate thing that happens to a small amount of people that use finasteride, and it can significantly affect their quality of life. So when you're considering to use finasteride, you may want to you know, weigh the options here of whether or not you wanna risk using finasteride and developing post-finasteride syndrome for uh, your hair, you know, how important your hair is for you and things like that. Now, again, I don't wanna fear monger because it happens to a very small amount of people, but I wanna go over the mechanisms of how or why this happens and also the prevalency in individuals who use finasteride, how often or how frequent is this syndrome occurring in the population. So, I'm going to cover a few bases here that you guys may know already, but finasteride is one of the only two drugs that is FDA approved for androgenic alopecia or hair loss. It's also used for BPH or benign prostatic hyperplasia to uh, improve symptoms of prostate enlargement. Um, finasteride belongs in the class of drug of 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. 5-alpha reductase is an enzyme uh, that is responsible for the conversion of testosterone into dihydrotestosterone. And dihydrotestosterone is multiple fold more androgenic than testosterone, and it binds to hair follicles and causes miniaturization and balding. The hair follicle will shed. So by inhibiting 5 alpha reductase, it, it decreases the conversion of testosterone into DHT and therefore decreases the binding of DHT to hair follicles and decreases um, hair loss and sometimes can promote hair growth. So that's all fine and dandy. Um, why does post-finasteride syndrome happen? Well, testosterone is a neurosteroid. It's a neuroactive neurosteroid. If you have low testosterone or high testosterone, or you know, you're on low testosterone, you got on TRT, or you're on cycle, you're gonna notice these effects um, on mood, anxiety, depression, libido penile sensitivity, and things like that. So when you have low testosterone, you may have anxiety, depression, low libido, you get on testosterone replacement, and these symptoms are relieved. So you can notice that this neuroactive neurosteroid testosterone, as well as estradiol, and the other two estrogens, estrone and estriol, are, ha have a potent effect on cognition, motivation, all sorts of cognitive and, and mental behavior as well as sexual function. Um, so testosterone is a, is a neuroactive neurosteroid. You have to forgive me, my brain is a little slow. Uh, it's, it's a neuroactive neurosteroid. The problem is 5-alpha reductase is an enzyme that is responsible for the um, synthesis of other neuroactive neurosteroids. And all neuroactive neurosteroids start with the uh, synthesis of pregnenolone from the from cholesterol, and downstream from pregnenolone are all these neuroactive neurosteroids that use different enzymes for the conversion of one neuroactive neurosteroid to the other. In this case, with testosterone and dihydrotestosterone, it's a conversion of testosterone to DHT, right? Using the uh, enzyme five alpha uh, reductase. So real quick, there have been a lot of studies and articles, uh, so many I can't even count, trying to pin down the mechanism of post-finasteride syndrome because it's widely recognized, recognized as a possible side effect of this medication. Um, and it's not 100% elucidated, although there are some possible theories and reasons why people might have post-finasteride syndrome uh, when they use finasteride and then have these persistent persistent side effects. In this article, it states, since 2008, at least 17 countries, including the United Kingdom and the United States, have warned prescribers of the potential for depression, sexual side effects, or both with finasteride. Post-finasteride syndrome is an ill-defined and controversial syndrome associated with the constellation of sexual, physical, and psychological symptoms that develop during or after finasteride exposure and persist after discontinuation. The incidence of post-finasteride syndrome is unknown, as there are biological mechanisms, but we know that 5-alpha reductase inhibitors reduce synthesis of brain neurosteroids, which affect mood, cognition, and libido. These neurosteroids that use 5-alpha reductase as a, an enzyme for synthesis uh, include allopregnenolone. Allopregnenolone is a neurosteroid that is derived from progesterone. Like I said, 
um, you know, it starts with cholesterol, then pregnenolone, and then you have a downstream cascade of synthesizing synthesis of other neuroactive neurosteroids. In this case, allopregnenolone is synthesized from progesterone. So allopregnenolone, allopregnenolone is a neurosteroid that is derived from progesterone. It is synthesized in the brain and it has potent positive allosteric modulator effects on GABA-A receptors, producing anxiolytic, sedative, and anticonvulsant, excuse me, my brain, I'll, I'll stutter a little bit, and anticonvulsant effects. 5-alpha reductase inhibitors can reduce the levels of allopregnenolone by inhibiting the conversion of progesterone to dihydroprogesterone, which is a precursor of allopregnenolone. So you'll have a decreased synthesis of allopregnenolone. Uh, you also have a decreased synthesis of 3-alpha andrastindiol. 3-alpha andrastindiol is a neurosteroid that is derived from DHT. So we, have, we already know that we have a decreased synthesis of DHT from testosterone. So when you have that decrease of DHT, you're going to have a decrease of synthesis of DHT into 3-alpha andrastindiol. So like I said, 3-alpha andrastindiol is a neurosteroid that is derived from DHT. It is a potent modulator of GABA-A receptors, and it has been implicated in various physiological and behavioral processes, including sexual behavior, anxiety, and depression. By reducing DHT levels, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors can decrease the production of 3-alpha andrastindiol. The third and final neuroactive neurosteroid that 5-alpha reductase is used in its synthesis is 3-beta andrastindiol, which is another neurosteroid derived from DHT. And like I said, when you have a uh, reduced synthesis of testosterone to DHT, you're going to have a reduced synthesis of DHT to 3-beta and 3-alpha andrastindiol. Uh, this neuroactive neurosteroid has been associated with cognitive function, neuroprotection, and modulation of GABA-A receptors, similar to 3-alpha andrastindiol. The levels of 3-beta androstendiol can be reduced by 5-alpha reductase inhibitors due to the decreased availability of DHT, like I just discussed. And it's important to note that the extent to which 5-alpha reductase inhibitors affect neurosteroid levels can vary depending on factors such as specific drug, dosage, and individual differences in enzyme activity and neurosteroid synthesis. So it has effects on other neuroactive neurosteroids besides the conversion of testosterone into DHT. And like I said, this has effects on, on mood, anxiety, depression, uh, cognitive function, libido, penile sensitivity, all sorts of things. Um, and so when you reduce the synthesis of these neuroactive neurosteroids, you may have these side effects. Not everyone experiences them, obviously, but you can have these side effects. Uh, for some individuals, when they stop the finasteride, the machine starts going again and you have the synthesis of these neuroactive neurosteroids and everything goes back to normal. For some individuals, uh, you would suspect that they would have this machine start back up again and you'd have this synthesis of um, uh, these neuroactive neurosteroids with the enzyme 5-alpha reductase and then they still have persistent symptoms. So you're wondering like, why the hell are they having these symptoms? There are a few potential explanations for why post finasteride syndrome can occur. And I'll get into that here. And again, I'm reading off my notes. So neuroplasticity changes is number one. So prolonged exposure to altered neurosteroid levels during finasteride treatment may induce long-lasting changes in the brain's neural circuit and receptor systems. These neuroplastic changes could potentially persist even after the drug is discontinued, leading to ongoing symptoms. Number two, there could be epigenetic modifications. Uh, so changes in DNA. Finasteride may cause epigenetic uh, changes such as DNA methylation or histone modifications that can alter gene expression and patterns related to neurosteroid synthesis or signaling pathways. These epigenetic changes would could potentially be long-lasting or even permanent, leading to sustained effect on neurosteroid levels or sensitivity. Number three, there could be individual variability. There could be individual differences in the ability of to restore neurosteroid levels or reverse the effects of an asteroid on various physio physiological processes. Factors such as genetic variation, age, or underlying conditions can influence the body's ability to recover from the effects of the 5-alpha re uh, reductase inhibition. So you may have a difficulty restoring the synthesis of these neurosteroids neuroactive neurosteroids, even after cessation of finasteride. Number four, there could be disruption of feedback loops. Finasteride may disrupt the complex feedback loops and regulatory mechanisms involved in neurosteroid synthesis and metabolism. These disruptions can potentially lead to ongoing imbalances or dysregulation even after discontinuing the drug. So it's important to note that these the exact mechanism behind post-finasteride syndrome is not fully elucidated. These are just possible 
mechanisms as to why they may occur. It's also important to note that um, post finasteride syndrome could could affect could be caused by different mechanisms with different individuals. So these these mechanisms, neuroplasticity changes, epi epigenetic modifications, individual variability, the disruption of feedback loops uh, with the synthesis of uh, neurosteroids, they're not going to be all inclusive where one person with post finasteride syndrome is going to have all these um, negative changes. It could just be one or two or any number of these possible negative uh, changes to feedback loops or individual variability, epigenetic changes or neuroplasticity changes. So the possible symptoms that are involved with post finasteride syndrome are extensive. Primarily, you're going to see individuals who have a decrease, a significant decrease in libido, but the symptoms can expand further than just sexual dysfunction. But number one would be sexual dysfunction, in my opinion. I've seen that more than any other, um, excuse me, symptom as far as post finasteride syndrome goes. So. Some, some symptoms of post finasteride syndrome could include sexual dysfunction, neurological and cognitive effects such as brain fog, depression, anxiety, insomnia, or lack of concentration. You'd have physical symptoms such as fatigue or lack of energy, muscle weakness or atrophy, gynecomastia, or testicle, testicular pain or shrinkage. You could have hormone imbalances such as decreased levels of testosterone, THT, or other hormones. You, have, you could have altered level, levels of neurosteroids, like we mentioned earlier. You may have metabolic issues such as weight gain or difficulties losing, losing weight, metabolic syndrome, and in insulin resistance. You could have dermatological problems such as dry skin, rashes, increased shedding, or thinning of hair. So like with any drug, when you're looking at the side effects, you're going to see a long list of side effects that are comprehensive. So when somebody has post finasteride syndrome, they may have just like one or two of these side effects and not all of them. Um, so that's something to consider when you're when you're discussing post finasteride syndrome. As far as the prevalency goes of this condition, it varies widely from somewhere around 1% to 20%. And the 20%, uh, you know, when I read that there, you know, it could affect 20% of individuals using finasteride, I, I was like, there's absolutely no way that's possible. Um, this drug would be taken off the market. No one would ever use it for hair loss. And it was that stat is that statistic in particular was reported by patient advocate um, groups who have been affected by post finasteride syndrome. So they may be a little bit biased and their research is not comprehensive. I would say the possibility of post finasteride syndrome is closer to the one to 5% or closer to the one to 2% range. So it is very, very unlikely that you'll have post finasteride syndrome when using finasteride. Um, it could be one in a hundred individuals or less. So overall, you know, when you're using finasteride, it's a five alpha reductase inhibitor. So it's going to reduce the conversion of testosterone into DHT, but it's also going to, going to reduce the conversion of, um, neurosteroids into other neurosteroids or pregnenolone into, um, you know, into this cascade of neurosteroids that uses different enzymes to, to synthesize other neurosteroids. Um, so in this case, it would be the synthesis of allopregnenolone, 3-alpha andrastindiol, 3-beta andrastindiol, and that has effects on uh, neuroprotection, mood, all sorts of things. Um, so a lot of indiv individuals won't have side effects. Some people will. Some people will stop using finasteride and the side effects will go away. Some people will stop using finasteride and the side effects will persist. Some people will stop using it and they will persist for a short period of time. Some people will, will stop using it and some side effects will persist uh, for an extended period of time, possibly permanently. Okay, so those are kind of, that's kind of the mechanism behind, or possible mechanisms behind why people get post finasteride syndrome and also the prevalency, you know, it's 1% to 20%. I would say it's definitely closer to 1%, possibly less. Um, and it's just something you should consider before you use a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor like finasteride or dutasteride, if it's worth it to you for your hair loss. Um, but for example, my my friend is on minoxidil and, and finasteride, oral finasteride, and um, he's having no problems whatsoever. So um, all the, although these neurosteroids are important for certain uh, behavioral processes and uh, signaling within the brain, a lot of people don't have any problems whatsoever. So I don't mean a fear monger. I just wanted to go into the mechanism of why this could occur 
possible symptoms associated with post finasteride syndrome and the possible prevalency of this condition. Uh, if you guys have any questions or want to talk about this, uh, just comment below or we can talk about it in my Discord. Um, I also have a, a Patreon going on. Uh, you can sign up for my Patreon for $10 a month and ask me as many questions as you want. And I'll help you out on anything from your TRT protocol to fitness um, to hair loss uh, and whatever else you guys might need help with. Okay, I hope this presentation was somewhat informative and you can use it to do some of your own research as well. Um, it's something you should consider before using a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor like finasteride or dutasteride, but it's also important to recognize that, yes, the odds of it happening are extremely low. Just make sure that, you know, for you, it's worth it for your hairline to use a drug like finasteride or discuss with your doctor the possibility of post-finasteride syndrome and what they've seen in their clinic. Um, because ultimately, that's what's most important is what doctors have seen in their clinic as far as post-finasteride syndrome. And uh, you can discuss, you know, your concerns, and then they can prescribe you it. It's one of the problems I have with HIMS, for example. HIMS can prescribe finasteride, oral finasteride, or topical finasteride online. And their doctors are very kind of cavalier with the way they prescribe it. So I really like it because it's really streamlined, and you can get it really fast, shipped to your door. I don't like it because they don't... Um, a lot of the conversations you're going to have with medical professionals online like that is going to be with nurse practitioners. And so, for example, I was going to use oral minoxidil and finasteride, and I have a de um, I have a disrupted blood brain barrier, uh, which can cause drugs to enter the brain and have uh, a brain vasculature, which has been disrupted um, and essentially have leakage into neural uh, brain tissue. And so drugs that would have certain effects on the brain um, could have unexpected effects. So I, I spoke with a nurse practitioner and I was like, hey, is it, is it a problem that I'm using, you know, finasteride and minoxidil with a disrupted blood brain barrier? And she immediately got back to me with a no, it's not a problem. And I really don't believe that because I've had several drugs I've used now, uh, pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical drugs that I've used with a disrupted blood brain barrier that had unexpected effects due to my disruption of the blood brain barrier. Anyway, that's the spiel on that. I literally forgot what I was just talking about. So um, we'll make that the end of the video. If you guys want to learn more about this, um, just let me know and we can make I can make another video that goes into more detail about specifics um, and maybe go into detail about the synthesis of, of um, neuroactive neurosteroids and things like that. Okay, I'll stop talking. Appreciate you guys and uh, consider that Patreon. And I'll talk to you later. Bye.